In part one, we saw how Margarita Borden became Margarita Segrod and then Margarita Himmler. Her father had bought her a stake in a Berlin clinic which she sold in order to buy a house and a chicken farm which she used to supplement the small income her husband made from the National Socialist Party. The couple had a daughter, but Margarita wasn't able to have more children, so they adopted a boy whose father had been killed in a street fight in February 1933. Their official position allowed them to travel, although Margarita Himmler was much less prominent than some of the other wives of Nazi officials. Margarita Himmler was a cold woman who bossed others around and seemed to be quite bitter. This bitterness was about to get much worse as World War II progressed. As soon as the war started, she moved to Berlin in order to work in a hospital. Hospital number 106. From a diary we can see that she immediately annoyed the other doctors, although she naturally claimed that it was them, even though they were SS. They had to be shown how to do everything. In charge was one Dr Becker, whom she described as pretentious. She claimed that he did not want her there although as it turns out he said nothing of the sort, and this was her excuse to give up the job that she did. From the beginning of December 1939, she supervised Red Cross hospitals in Military District 3, that is, Berlin-Brandenburg. As part of this activity, she also carried out business trips to countries occupied by the Wehrmacht. On the 3rd of March 1940, during a business trip to German-occupied Poland, she noted... I was recently in Poznan, Łódź and Warsaw. This pack of Jews, these Polacks, most of them don't look like people at all. And the indescribable dirt. It's an unheard of task to create order there. After this, she travelled to her native Bydgoszcz and noted that the Polish people did not die so easily from infectious diseases as they are immune. Bydgoszcz was, however, pretty bleak. In her diary, she complained that her husband never came home when she was in Berlin, probably through loneliness in her private life and bitterness at the people who she worked with in the Red Cross. She gave up Berlin and her war work and returned home. Nonetheless, she would keep returning to Berlin to the Red Cross for stints for a few weeks throughout the war. I wonder why the staff at the Red Cross put up with her tantrums and the only response I can think of is she was the wife of Heinrich Himmler. Most historians believe that by February 1941, at the very latest, she found out about her husband's relationship with his private secretary, Hedwig Potast. I believe that it was much earlier than this. I think that it would be natural that she might have known of some of the people on his close staff. She, he probably brought them back home with him from time to time. Margarita Himmler sent doilies and sweets for the young secretary for Christmas 1937. The following Christmas, however, Fraulein Potas was no longer on the presence list. What I experienced this year, Marga wrote in a diary on New Year's Eve 1938, was unimaginable. I therefore suspect that she already knew. We can imagine how she must have felt. Hedwig Potast was 19 years younger than she was, young enough to be her daughter. Furthermore, Margarita Himmler could no longer have children. The operation she had when the daughter was born made that impossible, and in any case, she was now well into her 40s. Unlike the wife of Martin Bormann, who seems to have been happy that her husband had found a mistress who could bear him sons, Margarita Himmler was humiliated and quite naturally bitter. It had been the money of her family which had allowed him to set up in business in the 1920s and fund his party work. Now he'd made it, he'd more or less dumped her. 
Her diary revealed that she wanted to be with him, but he clearly did not want to be with her for anything other than a short time. Heinrich Himmler continued to visit his wife and daughter at their shared residence in Gmund, especially to maintain his close relationship with his daughter. Himmler had a kind of second marriage with Potast, which he saw as being legitimised by the fathering of children. The couple had two children. However, both his wife and his lover stood by him unswervingly until the end. In the run-up to the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, there was a ban on leave. Heinrich Himmler cancelled this ban on leave, although for only one person, that is, himself. He gave himself a 36-hour pass. Perhaps he felt that as the panzers fell on the Red Army and his Einsatzgruppen fell on unarmed civilians, he would be too busy to see his wife and daughter. Or maybe the visit was due to an accident that had occurred when the water heater exploded whilst his wife was in the bath requiring stitches at the hospital in Tegense. So he flew from Berlin to his private home at Lake Tegense. On Thursday the 19th of June 1941, this photograph was taken at the Valet Valley close to the former Austrian border at Kufstein. During this trip, Himmler knew exactly what would happen in less than 72 hours just before dawn on Sunday. It was Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, then still an ally of Nazi Germany. His organisation, the Schultzstaffel of the NSDAP, was to play a crucial task in this military operation. On the Dübben Heath to the northwest of Leipzig, around 3,000 men of the Einsatzgruppen were still in training for their future murder mission in the Soviet Union. They were not given the order to move until after the Wehrmacht had attacked. It would seem that Himmler didn't say a word about this to his wife, Marga. We know this from her letters. Now we are at war again. I knew it. I didn't sleep well at all. Marga Himmler wrote to her husband shortly after hearing the news about the beginning of the attack on the Soviet Union in the morning of the 22nd of June 1941. But as a caring wife, she had also some good advice for her husband. There's still one can of caviar in the fridge. Take it. His daughter Gudrun also sent a letter to her father on that day. It's terrible that we are going to war with Russia. They are our allies after all. And the 11-year-old girl added another concern in her letter. Russia is so big, the struggle will be very difficult if we want to conquer all of Russia. As it turned out, this 11-year-old had given a better analysis of the situation than most of the grown-ups. Two days after the attack, Himmler made his way to Hitler's East Prussian headquarters, Falfschanze, in his personal train, Heinrich. Although he tried to call his home in Gmund almost every day, he still forgot a very important date. I felt so sorry that I forgot our wedding anniversary for the first time, Heinrich wrote to Marg on the 7th of July 1941, four days late. There was quite a lot going on these days, adding that the fighting's very hard, especially for the SS. That was true. Not all SS units were deployed murdering defenceless civilians. Some Waffen SS units were leading the assaults and suffering heavy casualties as a result. Apart from the fighting which had nothing to do with him, he also had his mistress. However, perhaps to make up for it, he did manage to get back to see them within a couple of weeks. On the 22nd July 1941, Himmler arranged a family day out. Gudrun was able to take her friend Röschen. She wore a summer dress and a bow in her hair. Gudrun Himmler found the place they visited simply wonderful. The young girl wrote in her diary, Today we went to the SS concentration camp in Dachau. It was nice. Of course, Gudrun did not find out under what inhumane circumstances the inmates lived, nor that they died of exhaustion or were randomly shot. After the visit, the girl only noted that they'd seen the large nursery, the mill, bees, herbs, all the pictures that the inmates had taken. Then we ate a lot, and then everyone got something for free. Der Führer bei Besprechungen mit dem Reichsführer SS, Reichsinnenminister Himmler. Mm-hmm. 
During the course of the war, contact between the Himmlers was mainly by letter, as Heinrich needed to be either in Berlin or near Hitler. Marga stayed at home in southern Bavaria. Clearly, Heinrich Himmler preferred the company of his girlfriend, Hedwig, or when things got too tough for him, he retreated to the clinic at Hochenlücken, which he used as a bold hole. On the 2nd of September 1943, she asked what might be expected in this year of her life. She confided to her diary that she believed in Hitler and that the German people could not perish. She was still officially working for the Red Cross and as such wanted to go to Berlin. Like many of us, she contemplated on her forthcoming 50th birthday and reflected on the trouble that she'd gone through during her life and that there was nothing to look forward to. She said that she now lived for her child, who was then 14. Das ist der Platz des verbrecherischen Anschlages, den ein kleiner Kreis gewissenloser Offiziere am 20. Juli auf den Führer und auf den Stab der Wehrmachtführung verübte. Ein gerechtes Schicksal hat das Verbrechen missglücken lassen. Margot was in Berlin from the 19th of June to the 20th of July 1944. This time coincided with her daughter's birthday and whilst in the capital she did some voluntary work handing out clothing to the victims of bombing raids. She congratulated herself in her diary lamenting that it was not easy to stand there for four hours on the stones of a basement of a ruined building. I suspect that it might have been a bit harder for those who had been bombed out in this National Socialist war, lost all their possessions and now had to rely on charity. She left Berlin on the 20th of July 1944. I think that she might have been warned. Her husband was in East Prussia on that day. She could have been told to get out of the capital. I've suspected for some time that this was no coincidence. Of course it might be. The coup could have backfired to such an extent that fighting may have occurred in Berlin and eyewitnesses have testified that this almost happened. Himmler made himself scarce for most of the day, possibly waiting to see which way the wind would blow. It goes without saying that Marga was disgusted that some army officers should attempt to overthrow Hitler. It's my belief that it is possible that Himmler knew about the 20th of July bomb plot before it actually happened. However, I'll deal with that in a different video. On the 18th of December 1944 she returned to Gmund. Munich had been hit twice by major air raids. Christmas that year was celebrated at home with her daughter and a friend and they played cards. On the 2nd of February 1945 she noted with pride that her husband was in the east and doing his bit to help. How wonderful it is that he is called on for such great tasks and can master them, she wrote. All of Germany looks to him. As it happened, Heinrich Himmler made a right pig's ear of directing army group Fistula. However, she seemed to realise that things were lost as her home village was now overrun and asked what would become of all her acquaintances in the east. Gudrun's school was intended to be converted into a hospital, but that had not yet happened. I wonder if it had anything to do with its star pupil, or is this just a coincidence? On the 21st of February 1945, she made the last entry in her diary, at least the one that survived. Her Aunt Marta had arrived from Danzig, which was now threatened by the Red Army. She complained that everything had got bad and that she was there at home only because her husband wanted her to be there, although she thought that one should stay at one's place in times of danger in order to set an example. Gudrun was back at school and Gerhard, who was now with an SS unit in Brno, was enjoying himself there, but it seemed as though he would not make it back before posting to the front. As it happened, 
she wasn't to see him again until October 1955. As the war drew to a close, the standard of living of mother, daughter and adopted son was about to get much worse. Clearly aware that she would likely be a wanted person, she took her daughter and fled from Gamund. In part three, we shall see how she fared after World War II.